All right. Perfect. Well, okay. So thank you very much, firstly, to the Fundamentals team uh, for this uh, invite. I appreciate it very much, particularly Shamila and uh, Seb and uh, Lucky for organizing all of this and putting it together. Thank you, Pierre and Ben, for doing outstanding talks uh, to get things going. And uh, a lot of mine will be repetition of some of the elements that they've already covered, for which I make no apologies. Uh, I'm a orthopedic trauma surgeon at King's College Hospital, uh, which is a major trauma center for those of you that don't know. Uh, I also have a consultant post as a pre-hospital care consultant, so that's an air ambulance consultant. And so I see a lot of these injuries in the pre-hospital setting when I'm working with a helicopter or the air, et cetera, but, and also treat them definitively uh, at the hospital. And then I have some academic and managerial posts uh, within the NHS. That's me. Anyway, so the principles of managing all of these injuries are, as has already been covered by Ben and Pierre very well, is history, examination, x-ray and some documentation. OK, the bottom line for history is it's fairly straightforward in terms of history taking. This is not a complex uh, chest infection or someone with, uh, you know, some funny neuro neurological condition. There's been usually a traumatic event and everything suddenly happened. So go for something across uh, along the lines of the ample history, which is what you learn in ATLS, which is allergies, medication, past metal, mass, past metal history, last meal, etc., and the event that caused the injury. In the examination, obviously you examine and see what you find, and a lot of it is kind of in terms of the look, feel, move uh, scenario. It's a lot of looking, so document clearly what you can see. Take photographs with a departmental camera, ideally, uh, rather than your mobile, uh, to which you know in order to kind of document them and put them in the notes, and also clearly describe what you can see in terms of injuries and deformities. In, when it comes to feel, there's not really a huge amount to feel because you don't want to really cause the patient significant amounts of pain and distress more than they already have. And again, in terms of movement, if you can see an obvious open fracture, please don't ask them to move the limb in question. You can ask them to move the toes or the fingers, for instance, because you're checking distal motor function, but don't ask them to move the knee if they've got a open knee injury of some sort. Now, the critical thing is neurovascular assessment, and I've put a strike through through the word neurovascular intact in that do not use that term. It means nothing. And what it does mean is extremely variable between people. Uh, and so it's not a consistent way. And, you know, when you're on call and you see someone and you write neurovascular intact, I can promise you it really means not much to the team who are seeing the patient the next day or the team who are taking the, theater, uh, the patient to theater the few days later. We, you know, no one really knows what that means. So I teach my trainees two options of managing this. Okay, so the first option is you can, if you, were, if you want, document each nerve so if you're doing the hand for instance you can document radial nerve function and then say radial nerve sensory function intact or radial nerve motor function intact median nerve motor function intact etc so you can do that uh, as much as you want and that is a very you know good way of doing it the other way that i kind of prefer slightly more although anything is better than neurovascular intact the other way i prefer is if you document what you're actually testing so I tell my, uh, so when I do a ward round, for instance, and let's, let's just say I've done a, um, some sort of acetabular surgery, so I'm worried about the sciatic nerve. So when we see the patient, I'll then get the patient to dorsiflex and plantar flex uh, their foot. And then in the, in the post egg ward round entry, it'll, write, it'll be written, patient can dorsiflex and plantar flex uh, their foot and ankle. Sensation present on the dorsum of the foot and the plantar aspect of the foot. And so there you've told everyone in your note what you've done exactly. And so if someone wants to test that again, they can just do the same test and then you can see a consistent finding. So keep it very specific. Don't write neurovascular intact. Uh, and in terms, and they're two separate things. So there's neurological assessment and vascular assessment. And again, vascular assessment, ideally feel for the pulses, look up capillary refill, talk about whether the foot or the hand is warm and well perfused, etc. And examine everything properly. Don't take shortcuts. You know, there's certain things you can rush uh, and kind of get them done reasonably well, uh, but examination is, needs to be done thoroughly and properly. And then obviously get your radiographs and then make sure you just document everything, especially if you intervene. And so some of the early things you'll be involved in in ED, especially when you're going to trauma calls as the uh, SHO or the registrar, 
in a trauma call, you'll have to do the reduction of fractures or dislocated joints, stabilize them. Uh, you'll have to do all of that. Make sure you document what you've done, reassess the neurovascular assessment, and so redo the neurovascular examination after you've intervened in any way and document your findings and then get a repeat x-ray. Yeah. So if, for instance, if you're putting a U slab on someone's humerus and you're worried about their radial nerve, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's okay. It's acceptable if their radial nerve function is affected and they've lost radial nerve function because you tried to manipulate something, you know, that is a complication and provided you've spoken to the patient about it, that's totally fine. Obviously it's not fine, fine, but you know, it's a, it's something that's happened. It's acceptable. What's not okay is if you do not re-examine. Yeah. So that's really not okay. So just make sure examination is thorough. Don't cut corners. Know your blood vessels and your nerves. And you know, you guys as the orthopedic people that are representing the orthopedic department at a trauma call, you are there for this kind of thing. Yeah. So, you know, commonly there to do secondary survey. But you're also there for your expertise in knowing where nerves are, knowing which nerves do what, and knowing where blood vessels are. So please put that knowledge, you know, and use it in the ED. You will really help out the ED team, the major trauma consultant, etc. So some of the bits I'm going to be talking about today, there are three topics I was asked to cover, which were vascular injuries, mangled extremities, and knee dislocations. Now, I find that vascular injuries and mangled extremities are sort of similar kind of things that happen in similar groups of patients. So I've largely grouped them together. The principles are broadly the same. So we'll just start beginning. Uh, we'll start to cover it now. There are two MCQ questions, mainly just to answer in the, during, the, to, during the talk. So in the pre-hospital scenario, this is the bit that you don't get to see. You know, typical scenarios will be cyclist hit by bus or hit by vehicle. And in this case, in this particular scenario, there is a patient under there. He's, he's fine in the end. Uh, but, you know, so all of this starts off in a very bad way. This is not a patient. This is a mannequin. Uh, and so this is a mannequin in a moulage training scenario for HEMS paramedics. And so here they're just practicing putting on uh, uh, tourniquets and uh, traction devices for femur fractures. And but what you see here is really how gory it can be and how unsettling it can be at the scene. And the first things to think about whether you are treating someone pre hospitally, whether you are, and you'll be surprised how many bystander medics there are in the roads of uh, London. Uh, but if you're a bystander and you see something happen or someone comes into hospital, the first thing to do with a significant vascular injury is to control the bleeding. Okay. And direct pressure is basically the most successful uh, intervention pretty much all of the time. Other things like tourniquets, uh, various other devices are all kind of used later but direct pressure putting a finger in the hole where it's bleeding from or controlling or doing proximal control with direct pressure above a bleeding point will actually help nearly all the time you can use hemostatic agents like salox gauze which is basically something that it's, uh, something you can put into a region that's bleeding heavily it'll get incorporated as part of a clot and actually clot off anything independent of uh, inr and cofactors etc Things like pelvic binders, Kendrick traction devices for femur fractures, all help realign and splint a limb, effectively providing some form of tamponade to any ongoing bleeding. Obviously, you can use tourniquets. Uh, there's certain scenarios in which you should use them and other scenarios which they won't be of any use. We can discuss that later. And also, there's certain blast dressings, again, that you can use that are very useful. Tranexamic acid is something that's carried by all pre-hospital care services. So that's ambulances and HEMS teams and will get given fairly readily at the scene, pretty much as often as paracetamol is given. So we'll go to MCQ1. And I, uh, so uh, I don't know if there's any easy way of loading this up. Oh, there we go. So this is the question. So in patients with a mangled lower extremity, what do you do first? Do you assess the pulse? Do you assess the nerves, call the vascular team, get x-rays first, or assess the patient via ABCD approach with ATLS principles? Please remember what Ben and Pierre said before I uh, said in their earlier talks. I'm just, I'm going to give a wrong answer for the sake of it. 
Awesome. Okay, so that's excellent. 97%. Right. So this is the answer for the MRCS exam, the FRCS exam, and life as a consultant. Okay. You always want to treat the life and limb threatening injuries first. Okay. So, you know, if someone hasn't got a patent airway or is not breathing or is exsanguinating from their chest or abdomen, it's great that you're going to save their mangled foot, but really it doesn't matter in the scheme of things. So make sure that you prioritize everything. And so that's why the ABCD approach, as per ATLS principles, is a fantastic basic way of going through things. Whether you've got a mangled extremity like you have here with the foot in the central image, something that's very nasty open fracture in the far left, or again, their mangled proximal tibial injury here. You can have other injuries, so just a spectrum of injuries. So this is mangled bilateral low limb. So this is someone who is walking very close to a uh, articulated lorry, or basically a dumper truck that was traveling at speed and basically slipped off at the same time as the dumper, tr uh, dumper truck, which is traveling right next to the pavement. And their legs were basically sucked into the wheel arch. And so you, this is pretty mangled, right? They've degloved everything from the umbilicus all the way down to both feet. And so, you know, all the skin has basically been sheared off, all the muscle, multiple fractures everywhere. And so this is as, as, mm, as severe as it gets. And on the far right is the image from intraoperative uh, where, uh, surgery where they've done an extensive debridement to limit the blood loss, limit the contamination. So how do you manage all of these injuries? And in this gory photo here, this is someone who's come off their bike. You can see a tourniquet very high up literally just a, you know kind of at shoulder level really but over the deltoid stemming any bleeding from uh, their arm but you can see their arms basically being all, almost amputated this is their elbow or what's left of the forearm and the radial head in in the far left of the picture and effectively the humerus is not there uh, and so you you know so mangled extremities are a very kind of variable type of injury going from mild all the way to incredibly severe Principles stay the same though. ABCD approach, ATLS principles, examine and instigate some early treatment. Always remember pain relief. Think about realigning the fracture. And so when I say think, I mean do realign the fracture, especially if there's a vascular injury, because that realignment will usually help restore vas uh, vascular patency. Splint the fracture. So that's basically use a plaster or some sort of device. And usually it's a back slab for us. And then re-examine everything. So you've examined once, you've done some interventions, re-examine it again, document everything. And the documentation is key. You guys are the most important people there from, the, from our orthopedic departmental point of view, because when I'm on call, I'm not in A&E when someone like this comes in, right? But my SHO and my registrar are, are, I totally trust them that they will do things by the book and document everything. And then kind of when we all go to theater as a big team, and we do stuff to our patient that we know that we can trust that our buddies who did the initial assessment and treatment did all the right things and documented everything. And that's what it's all about. Okay. So for any given patient, so the question is, well, what do you do next? So you give more pain relief to make sure that they're okay and comfortable. You don't want patients needlessly suffering. It's just not okay these days. Antibiotics where it's required. And that's pretty much in every scenario generally. Um, and so then I've put down if hard vascular signs and if there are soft signs. Okay, so what do you do next if there's hard vascular signs? Okay, so the question first is what are hard vascular signs? So hard vascular signs are cold, a cold periphery. So a cold foot, a cold hand, etc. Uh, loss of pulses, so no palpable radial pulse, uh, no palpable dorsalis pedis or posterior tibial pulse. So, you know, so let's just quickly dip out. Let's go to think about a supracondylar fracture where you've got a white hand, no pulse in the radial or ulnar arteries, okay? So that's a hard vascular sign. Now, in the scenario of hard vascular signs, these are patients that need to go to theater ASAP. It's, it's very clear that these patients do not benefit from a delay to theater for the sake of imaging. Because you'll always find that other, uh, you know, your surgical colleagues, your vascular colleagues may want imaging, and that's totally fine because it will help them potentially to know where the site of injury is. But more often than not, and pretty much always, 
the site of where the vascular injury is usually at the same level of where the uh, bone or joint injury is. Yeah, so if someone's got a knee dislocation, the vascular injury is almost always in the popliteal artery. It's never in the distal part in the tibial artery, and it's never in the femoral artery, pretty much always in the popliteal artery. So hard vascular signs don't delay time to theater. If you can be efficient and kind of can get patients seamlessly from the emergency department into the CT scanner and then onwards from the CT scanner to the operating room, then that's perfect. That would be an ideal scenario. And to be honest, with a bit of, a, uh, with a bit of organization, that's eminently possible. Now, if there are soft signs, and this is where you have patients who have kind of, you know, pal potentially palpable pulses or the pulse is slightly difficult to feel, but you've got something on Doppler and their hand feels kind of warmish, doesn't feel that cold, and you're kind of umming and eyeing. And, you know, with all of this, you, sh you know, vascular surgeons need to be called to help you with this. And none of you, none of you should be left out uh, on your own kind of trying to decide vascular uh, what to do from a vascular point of view. That's what the vascular team are for. And so if you have soft signs, then imaging is definitely an option uh, to go. And so that's CT angio in order to determine what the vascular injury is and what the extent of the injury is. So hard sign surgery, plus minus CT on the way to surgery, soft signs imaging, and then decide from there on in. So if you do go to theatre, the question is, when do you go to theatre? So uh, Ben's already spoken about open fracture guidelines and when to go to theatre. And the answer is, for these kind of mangled extremities, vascular issues, you want to get them to theatre ASAP. Time is money in these patients, especially if you've got very high up injuries. You have less time the higher up you go. So you, if you have a vascular injury that's down at the level of the ankle, you have slightly more time than if you have an injury that's mid-thigh. Okay. So just remember, the more significant injury there is, the less time you have. And also there's the usual open fracture guidelines of compartment syndrome, a contamination, marine agricultural sewage, all these cases all again justify you going to theater. In terms of the vascular team, their aim is to restore perfusion ASAP. And the BOST guidelines, which I've highlighted at the bottom here, and there's BOST guidelines for vascular injuries, High, suggest time uh, tire restoring perfusion within four hours. This is a slightly variable time. You know, it's different for different types of injuries. So injuries at the level of the ankle is potentially slightly longer. You've got a slightly bigger window, but mid thigh open fractures, you've got a slightly shorter window. I'm just going to say someone's got their mic on. If you could just mute it, if that's all right. Thank you. Uh, and again, in terms of the order of things to do, you need to have a surgical plan and you need to have spoken to your vascular team and had a discussion about who's going to do what first. And it's really important that that happens. And that's why it's important to make sure that your boss is there, make sure that the vascular team is there and that their bosses are in and have a high level, ideally consult to consult decision and discussion and operation where everyone knows who's doing what first, etc. Because sometimes you'll want to think about Put a, going straight to a vascular surgery first, and that's fine. And then you can do the bony bit later. Sometimes the bone fracture, also the bony injury might be very unstable. And then you want to think about orthopedic intervention first, and then vascular repair later. Or sometimes it's unstable, but time again is very short. And the vascular surgeons can do a temporizing procedure where they shunt the blood across the injury site. And then they do that. And then we put an X-fix on, for example, and then they go back and then do a definitive uh, repair or graft of the injured vessel. So again, it's, you know, there's no, I could put a little pathway of all the options, but I think the key element to remember is it's a proper discussion and plan between vascular and ortho about who does what when and making sure the anesthetist is also involved in this. And just, you know, for reference, just go again back to both. This is your answer, you know, in MRCS and FRCS and in life, the answer is follow the BOST guidelines. They're there for a reason. They're made by a lot of people that you guys have worked for. A lot of people that I've worked for have been instrumental in making these BOST guidelines. They're all UK guidelines designed for us, all based on good evidence. Let's go to the next slide. Then the other question is, well, what about an extended debridement? What about an amputation? And so the answer is yes. Yeah. So sometimes, 
in this case here, if you go from right to left, you have this significant proximal tibial injury. And then if you go look closer at the wound, effectively, there's massive tissue destruction in the proximal tibia. And literally a bit of tendon and a bit of muscle is the only thing in continuity. And this is not viable, uh, you know, in order to reconstruct. And sometimes that's the case. Now, so if that's the case or your debridement surgery, et cetera, is actually going to be a significant debridement, an extended debridement or an amputation, all effectively meaning the same thing. It's really a multi-consultant decision. And generally we like three consultants making that decision usually something along the lines of an orthopedic consultant, plastic surgery consultant, and a vascular surgery consultant. Ideally, you can substitute in a medicine, medicine consultant or something like that uh, if you haven't got all three specialties on site. But if you're at a major trauma center, you should, be, you should have all three specialties. So it's fairly feasible to get sign off. And so you share the decision making across multiple consultants to everyone checks that they're happy with that decision. And then you carry on with that. So shared decision making. So in terms of the summary for this, which is a summary for the whole talk, and there's a few more slides about knee dislocation after this, but the summary is ABCDE, ATLS, early treatment, make sure you document everything, investigations, and then theatre. And it's all about timing, who you go to theatre with, with, and the political plan when you get there. And now I'll just go to knee dislocations. So knee dislocations. So uh, yeah, so they're quite, they can be a complicated thing, but I think we'll just keep it simple. So more often than not, knee dislocations are a high energy injury, high energy injury. There's a high rate of nerve and vascular injury. And you have to remember, if you ever see patients in clinic and they tell you they had a knee dislocation, we're not talking about a patella dislocation, right? That's what patients often mean by knee dislocation. What we're talking about is a proper full-on tibiofemoral dislocation as highlighted by the picture on the right here, which is a lateral radiograph showing a dislocation. Usually more often, often happens in males and that's just due to the nature of trauma. As I say, high energy RTA, but you can have low energy versions in sports, in sporting injuries. So rugby injuries, et cetera, American football for the Yanks. When you come to assess these injuries, one of the first things you want to know is, is the knee dislocated or has it reduced? And the vast majority actually spontaneously reduce at the scene. If they don't, you'll actually find that a lot of pre-hospital care teams, ambulance services, et cetera, will reduce them. So a lot of them will come to you already being reduced. If they're not, you will have to do the reduction. A neurological assessment is again, key, common perineal nerve is the important one. And as you know, that's because the common perineal nerve travels uh, down the lateral side uh, of the knee and is very closely related to the fibula head. Um, and so again, is at risk from these injuries. Vascular injury again is common. Clinical examination is usually not enough. So, you know, other things that people do are ABPIs. And again, as I mentioned, don't delay surgery just for imaging. Now, vascular injury is common, and I'll come to why in a second. Some of the other things you can find in examination is something called a dimple sign. So this is the back of the knee. And so sometimes what happens is you get uh, the medial femoral condyle buttonholing through the medial capsule of the knee. And so this becomes an almost irreducible knee dislocation. So why is the popliteal artery at risk? So this is why. So this is the back of the knee, so the popliteal fossa. The black line is the level of the knee joint. And you can see the popliteal artery here is intimately related to the back of the knee. It's surrounded by lots of tendons, lots of muscles, lots of nerves and veins, and it's tethered down all over the place. So it's a high risk. And if you look at cadaveric studies that look at how much the artery is related to the back of the knee, during all ranges of motion except for deep flexion, that artery is almost tethered right to the back of the proximal tibia. So it's at high risk of injury. Okay, MCQ2. Yeah, so in a knee dislocation, when should you consider a CT angiogram of the lower limb in order to determine the need to go to the theater? Only when pulses are absent, only when there is distal neurological deficit, 
you should consider a knee a CT angio in all patients suffering a knee dislocation, or only when cap refill is prolonged, or only when the foot is told. I'm going to submit my answer. I'm going to see if that poll result comes up. Yeah, so it's interesting. So generally, we would advocate, and this is these are pretty good results, we would advocate that all patients with a knee dislocation have a CT angio. So there is a 30% miss rate if you go on clinical examination and ABPIs of occult damage to the popliteal artery on CT that's found on CT that's not picked up clinically. So you'll find that in most major trauma centers, pretty much everyone with a knee dislocation is having a CT angiogram. If you went by the textbook of what you can do and what would still be acceptable is you would palpate it. And if you have palpable pulses, uh, then that's fine. You do ABPIs and look at the ABPI ratio. And if you're kind of over 0.8 or 0.9, I think, then you just kind of expectantly manage that. But if your ABPI number was less than 0.8, then you would go to CT. But as I say, most units operate a CT everyone kind of uh, protocol. And so this is why. So this is a lateral CT. So the knee's back in joint. It's a multiligamentous injury of the knee. Knee's back in joint. Popliteal artery is here. But this tiny, tiny little black line here pointed by the big arrow is an intimal flap in the popliteal artery. Okay. That is super tiny, but that one, two things can happen to that. One, it can lead to the formation of pseudoaneurysm, which can clot off and thrombose the vessel, or it can be the start of a thrombus. And again, you then get thrombosis across the vessel, and then you get distal stoppage of distal flow. And you have to remember a lot of these patients are, you know, young in their life or middle-aged or whatever, but there's no massive history of uh, vascular disease and so they've never really built up a proper collateral circulation so even in some settings where you have significant injury so like the next one in this patient who's dislocated their knee and has really rogered their popliteal artery they may well have flow distal to popliteal artery and if you look at this 3d recon you can see flow in the tibial artery in the leg and the question is well how is that possible because clearly you can see in the CT that they've completely shut down the popliteal artery. It is pretty closed off there and either it's transected or it's fully thrombosed or whatever. Uh, and there's no flow distally below it, but here in the lower leg at the, you know, kind of the junction of the uh, top, the uh, first, uh, at the junction of the uh, proximal third and area, you can see flow and that's basically because there is some collateral circulation where blood has gone round and uh, filled up distally. But in young people, middle-aged people, people without any history of vascular disease, these collaterals are very tiny. So the flow is really poor. So you can get this false sense of security that you have some flow distally, but it's ineffectual. And what actually ends up happening is all the muscles are just dying off during this entire time. And so it's really important that these kind of patients just go to theater because all of this distal flow is pretty insufficient. And again, you can see here in this angio, this is someone who's got bilateral knee dislocations. So they've reduced them and this unfortunate patient with reduced knee dislocations has still got popliteal artery issues and it has no flow, but they've got some circulation going on around in collaterals, but it's really, really insufficient for their needs so they'll continue to have muscle death they'll eventually develop uh, myonecrosis distally and lose function of their limbs so how do you treat knee dislocations so the vast majority will be closed reductions so you treat them in an expectant fashion so you, sorry for the formatting not sure what happened to the picture you treat them with closed reduction ideally as i mentioned this would have already happened pre-hospitally or you may have to do it and then you manage them expectantly. Do a CT angio to exclude any vascular injury. Speak to your vascular consultants about this. They need a specialist knee brace usually to just kind of you know keep the knee stable and keep it in joint. And they do need delayed orthopedic intervention. I mean, in the planning for any orthopedic surgery, they'll invariably have an MRI scan, et cetera, to determine what ligaments are injured and the order of fixation. And that's 
uh, a separate talk in itself. But the early management is all this. Now, if you're unfortunate enough to, and unlucky enough in your on-call to have something that needs to go to theatre, then surgery may be indicated if you have a irreducible knee dislocation, if you have an open fracture dislocation, a vascular injury, or as mentioned by Pierre, a compartment syndrome. And in these cases, you will have to think about external fixation from the orthopedic point of view because the brace isn't the right option at that time. So in terms of external fixation, you set up the pins and the bars pretty much here as it's shown in this photo that I've taken from the AO website. You have the knee in about 15 degrees of flexion. Um, and again, you speak to your vascular surgeon about who does what first. If they want to go in and do their bit first, they're the most important person for someone with a vascular injury, so let them do that. Um, but at some point, you will need to stabilize that knee. Again, you need external fixation for vascular repair, for open dislocations, compartment syndrome, and polytrauma cases as well. And on the lateral films, you'll have something that looks like this. This is the uh, laterals for the uh, angio that you saw earlier. All right, I'm pretty much coming to the end of my talk. And so the summary for both talks is exactly the same as the summary you saw earlier. Whoever you treat, A, B, C, D approach and ATLS principles, assess them, give them pain relief, realign, splint, assess again, and then document everything. Treat these patients early and treat other injuries first, okay? No one's gonna thank you for treating their mangled foot first if we've ignored their airway, ignored their pneumothorax, their tension pneumothorax, ignored their bleeding spleen, okay? So treat the other injuries first, get them treated first. Pain relief is important, antibiotics, and then you can treat our orthopedic injuries second, if that's where they are. Investigation, CT angio, bloods, ECG, et cetera, get them ready for theater if that's what needs to happen. And then we've spoken in regards to theater about timing for open fractures, compartment syndrome, and vascular injuries today. And who do you go with? You go with your orthopedic team, but also you go with your vascular surgeons where they're needed. And then always have a surgical plan. No matter what theater you're going to, just generally in life, have a surgical plan for what you're going to do in theater when you get there. All right, at that point, I will now stop going to share if anyone wants to get in touch uh, please feel free there's my email on the bottom left and uh, our twitter handle for our orthopedic department at kings and for those of you when you come off the top and you're looking for a trauma fellowship feel free to give us a shout we're more than happy look to uh, have a chat with you guys sorry for that uh, branding there seb <laughs> no worries um thank you very much mr vasway that was a really good talk um, does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask Mr. Vasreddy or any of the rest of the team regarding major trauma? Ah, here we go. So what is the best close reduction technique for knee dislocations? Oh, they're all coming down. Yeah, so the best close reduction, usually the easiest way is a little bit of flexion. So 15 to 30 degrees of flexion. The key thing here is to make sure that your patient is analgesed, probably sedated, comfortable and that you've examined them in detail before you do this and then you get them to 15 to, 15 to 30 degrees of knee flexion and effectively do an anterior draw okay and that kind of works on most of them it kind of depends which way the knees uh, dislocated if you have the femoral shaft anterior then doing an anterior draw will work if the femoral if the distal femur posterior to the proximal tibia then you effectively need to do a posterior draw but that, all that will become apparent when you get a little bit of knee flexion and then you can basically make it look anatomical. Um, I see the next question is about ED. Would you recommend attempted reduction of a knee dislocation in ED prior to imaging? Ah, so the difficult one. So if there's any hint of a vascular issue, the answer is yes. Yeah. So you don't delay imaging to intervene for a vascular emergency. That's basically the bottom line. So Tom, and if you have any issues about vascular insufficiency you do the ed relocation first then you get imaging i get my or if my tendency for this for any kind of things like this is to do the reduction first uh, uh so yeah yeah i'm sure you saw the question but essentially exact me exact method of uh, reduction obviously dependent on which direction the dislocations occurred yeah uh, pretty much how I described it, I say the key element is get the knee flexed about 15, 30 degrees. 
And the reason being is you want your gastrocnemius muscles all relaxed. You don't want the knee fully extended because then they'll all be tight. And then it's a case kind of fighting the, uh, the muscle tension. So if you have the muscles relaxed, the patient sedated, then you can gradually do this. And as I say, it's all about doing an anterior posterior draw. But once you flex their knee, it'll become apparent which way you need to do this, right? Uh, because either the femur is going to be behind the tibia or it's going to be in front. And then you just move it anteriorly or you move it posteriorly. Brilliant. Any other questions from the, from the audience? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Mr. Vasredi. Uh, thank you to Ben and uh, Pierre, if, you, if you're still knocking around. Um, so everyone, make sure you fill in the feedback. I'm just going to share that now. Um, this The feedback's the only way we know whether you've actually attended the talk or not. So um, please make sure you fill that in. Um, 